Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris McCarthy, and I'm the executive director here at the Provincetown Art Association and Museum. And it is my pleasure and, well, mixed pleasure to welcome you to the final Freddie Schiff Levin of the season. Um, we've had a wonderful, really fabulous array of lectures, and we'll continue to do so next year. But for the purposes of tonight, our lecture is Creative Certainty, the Life and Work of David Schoenberg, a lecture with the writer John Briggs, in conjunction with the exhibition David Schoenberg, A Life with Color, 1984 to 1993. This beautiful exhibition was curated by Martha Seelenberger and is on view at PAM through November 6th. A beautiful exhibition catalog with essays on the artist is for sale in the bookstore, and it's really a gorgeous book. Um, this lecture series was begun in 2003 in honor of the artist Freddie Schiff Levin, who was a member of Provincetown's arts community from the 60s until her passing in 2002. And Pam very gratefully acknowledges John and Tony Levin, who make this program possible with their generous support. So let's give them a round. Thank you so much. Um, we are pleased to welcome longtime friend of the artist and professor of aesthetics, John Briggs. John has said that David's paintings embody, through color, complexity, and gesture, an insightful state of mind far beyond meaning, a state focusing on the human struggle to confront uncertainty. Tonight, John will explore how David Shaneberg's work both expresses and extends the artist's lifelong investigation into the nature of consciousness. John Briggs holds a PhD in aesthetics and psychology from the Union Institute and University and an MA in literature from New York University. He's a real slacker, this one, let me tell you. He has written for years, he has written for years on the subjects of creativity and creative process in science and the arts, authoring and co-authoring several well-known books on chaos, fractals, and creativity, including Fire in the Crucible, Fractals, the Patterns of Chaos, Looking Glass Universe, and Turbulent Mirror. Briggs was the editor of a 2012 collection of essays, Creativity and Compassion, How They Come Together. Former senior editor of Connecticut Review, he guest edited the spring 2015 issue of About, of About Place on the subject of the primal paradox. He's a fine art photographer with a recent book of photographs, Curtains, Windows on the Unreality We Live In. His stories and poems have appeared in numerous literary publications. He's an emeritus distinguished professor at Western Connecticut State University and a fellow at the Black Earth Institute. Please help me welcome John Briggs. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction and to Pam. Uh, and thank you all for coming tonight uh, to ponder the extraordinary work of my old friend David Shainberg. Uh, I won't hope to do it justice, but in an important sense, David's work speaks for itself. It was made to speak for itself. If you get a chance between my work, my droning on here, uh, to take a look at that, at those lines there from Wallace Stevens. <clears throat> I'm titling the talk, retitling the talk, I guess, uh, David Schoenberg, Connoisseur of Process, in allusion to one of David's favorite poets, uh, authors, poet Wallace Stevens. <clears throat> On David's last day, as he lay unconscious in a New York hospital bed, <clears throat> I sat by him for a few minutes and read some of Wallace Stevens' poems in hopes that he would hear the words at some level of that wonderfully subtle consciousness of his and take comfort and amusement in them as he had always in his life. Some caveats, <clears throat> as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, I'm, I'm talking to you tonight not as an expert in painting or the history of art. Uh, my lifelong professional focus has been in aesthetics, uh, which is related to anesthesiology, I think. But. <clears throat> I've thought a great deal in my life about the relationship between aesthetics and creative process. That is the relationship between artistic forms and creative process that produces them. And also about the connections between human creativity, artistic forms, and the scientific understanding of creativity, how it happens. I knew David from the early 1970s when he employed me as a managing editor of a newsletter. He had turned into a journal the Academy for the American Academy of Psychoanalysis. We published many original essays by thinkers and investigators 
of the then new ideas about altered states of consciousness and the curious relationships of consciousness to the conundrums of modern physics. As you may already know, David started out his adult professional life in medicine, psychiatry. He was a leading psychotherapist of his day and one of the original theoreticians of the rich line of inquiry that eventually became known as consciousness studies. As part of that, <clears throat> of that, along with his friend physicist David Bohm, David was deeply interested in the work of the Indian philosopher sage Jiddu Krishnamurti. To give you some flavor of that pre-painter period of David's life, I'd like to play a few minutes from a dialogue between David and Krishnamurti uh, in 1983. Here you get to see David himself. See, the question I, I came up with is this. What do you think, or what, what is the, the power or the, the intensity that goes along with the immediacy, that illusions have such immediacy? In other words, why, why is it that illusion and what thought creates has such power and such immediacy. That's question one, I will. And then somewhere along the line, what can a person do if, let's say, if I or if you see the, the illusion of my, the immediacy in my illusions, and you see the, the, the quality of my illusions, what can a person do for another person who is caught up in their illusions? Those are two questions. So first of all, what do you mean by illusion? Well, when I use the word illusion, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm going from discussions we've had before where we talk about the fact that thought creates a reality. Thought what creates illusion. Creates illusion. Well, and, and so therefore it is illusion since it's making it up. So. And it has such immediacy. I mean, you know, uh, we all, invest our thoughts with such intense needs. We've invested in security. Well, what, what, do you, what is that, this immediacy and illusion of thought? When you use the word immediacy, does it mean the urge to fulfill, the urge to do something? Yeah. I don't quite understand the, when you use the word immediacy. What do you mean by that? Well, when I, I'm using the word immediacy in the sense of uh, um, a reality, a, um, if I really feel that I have, I mean, let's say this, that if I imagine, take it at two levels, if I imagine myself falling off uh, a, a, a wall, I'll jump. So that thought and that imagination has immediacy a intensity. If I have the thought that I could must... You, could we express it differently? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not getting the meaning of what you're talking about. Well, I'm really saying that we have thoughts that we invest with importance. Yes, let's stick to that. Okay. Yes. yes. Now, what makes us invest it with such importance? In other words, how come we can't see, I mean, I, I'm really referring back to my work as a doctor where a patient comes in and will say, you know, terribly depressed if somebody died, terribly depressed if their lover doesn't show up, terribly depressed if they lose a job. Those are thoughts which have importance, but they have, for this person, it's as if it's the whole life has collapsed. That's what I mean by immediacy. Urgency. Of all is the urge of desire to fulfill. I'm not getting you there. Because I'm not I'm not getting your meaning at all. Well, let me try <laughs> another way. We talk a lot about what thought does. Yes. Uh, we said that thought is limited, 
thought, whatever it does, whether in the technological world or in the psychological world, is limited. Exactly. I mean, a person who is concerned about himself all day long, his whole attitude towards life and towards the world is very, very, very small. Right. Now, how come he, he thought is limited, but actually thought begins to seem like it's unlimited? It, that's, a, that's just an idea. That's, that's an illusion. illusion. Well, but that actually happens. So what is your question then? So what makes that happen? In other words, ah. what makes thought appear so unlimited? And we invest it with such unlimited virtues. Who does this? Everyone in this world that I know. I mean, and people think of it, think of their, like yesterday in our discussion, the man says he's getting better because he can take a vacation, right? So in a way, he has invested his thought. You see what I'm getting at? No. You still don't. <laughs> no, let's try me. This is what we try. People do invest their... Would, would you mind changing the words? Not to invest. You get, move away from this. All right, we'll move away. We'll try another way. Yeah. We think what we think is, is, un, important. is important. That keep it at that. We, what we think is important, which is our prejudice, our ideas, our, our ideas, our ideologies, exactly. our experience. We think that's important. Exactly. Now, you're, now you're getting it. Yes. Now we're good. Now what is that? No. No. What, not what is that. <coughs> Why have they become important? But they start out important. No. Why have... I have an experience, suppose, or I come to some definite conclusion. Okay. All right. I've thought a great deal about it, read about it, talked to people, and I've come to a, diff a conclusion that's final. Right, right. In that finality, there is a certain sense of, at last, I've understood. This is what I must do, right. or not do, and proceed from there. Right. Now, what is the question? <laughs> Put it from there. From there, the question is, how did it get to be that you think it's important, that it's important and that it's final? Because it has happened to me, mm -hmm. and I have seen all the implications of it, mm -hmm. all the implications of an accident, or a, a, I've reasoned it out, and I said, this is so. Yeah. But the difficulty is you come along and say it's not so. Yeah. Then I, I hold on to what I've come, my conclusion. Hold on to my conclusion. Because I say it's not. You mean it's simply no, in reaction? you say it's not. Yeah. Your conclusion is wrong. Unless I'm willing to listen to you, examine it, then I'll ch change it. But if I'm not willing to listen to you, examine it, I won't check. I won't say that's what I think. Yeah, but before you already thought it was important, what you thought. Yes, sir, because it's happened to me. So it's, it's me that's the issue. Yeah, because I... Because it happened, happened to, me. to me. So that you've invested me with importance. Yes, me becomes the important. Why? That's uh, I, your question now is quite different. Why human beings all over the world have given importance to the idea of the meaning? Yes. Yeah. Such importance. Huh? Such importance. Tremendous huh? importance. Yes. 
the whole world circles round. Right. From yeah, but, and I, so what does it? You know, what, in the, mean, what does it? I mean, work? in other words, why? Why does? Uh, why do? Why do human beings give importance to their own self-centered right. activity? Right. That's right. Why? Okay. Just really get to the good part. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of it is on YouTube. <laughs> And it's very, it's very interesting to, to watch all, all the way to the end because uh, Krishnamurti says, we got to something. You know? And <clears throat> I mean, there are many layers of things that you could say about that exchange. Getting on the same wavelength and figuring out what it is they want to say. B, that maybe what you were looking at there was a creative process as they started to interact. Uh, and C, I don't know, <laughs> the, the, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's worth watching those little interactions that, that take place. Uh, uh, this particular dialogue uh, was three years before Christian Murdy's death in 1986 <clears throat> and comes at a time when, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in David's life, when he had decided to give up his psychoanalytic practice and devote his full energies to painting. His decision is embedded, uh, that's a David word, uh, in the question he poses to Krishnamurti. What can a person do for another person who was caught up in their illusion? David had come to the difficult insight that trying to help others in a psychoanalytic context of doctor and patient uh, furthers an existential illusion because the doctor himself is entangled in thought no less than the patient is. Thought seeks certainty and gets caught in delusion about escaping uncertainty. And the psychoanalytic dyad becomes complicit in that, he argued. In the process of painting, on the other hand, David saw the possibility that he could, as he put it, quote, constantly challenge the nature of consciousness. Let's see if I got it. And <clears throat> challenge the nature of consciousness and at least temporarily break through the false certainties of thought to something else, a freedom from the false certainties about self, God, measures of sanity, even theories of aesthetics, whatever it is. In a sense, a Schoenberg painting invites you as a viewer to challenge and work through the repetitive membrane of your own consciousness as it busily tries to resolve the painting into acceptably familiar forms and interpretations. David's paintings are designed in a way to stir thought and its penchant for interpretations and conclusions into an uproar. In this way, as David put it, see new possibilities in the painting and feel connected to something larger than the painting. As a generalization, I would argue that artists are engaged in the activity of creating objects and experiences that have a subtle, acute, sometimes searing meaningfulness, sense of meaningfulness, but this meaningfulness cannot be reduced to meaning without destroying the very tremblings of the neurons and the feeling tones that the artwork creates. Virginia Woolf referred to the meaningfulness that was the objective of her art as expressing moments of being. Many artists think of this quality in terms of making a work that exudes presence. James Joyce called the objective whatness or epiphany. The word spirit is often used uh, in the East. The elusive quality is framed in terms of chi, with a sense of opposites and wholeness implied. Throughout history, artists have also used the word truth, meaning aesthetic truth allied to beauty and also having a holistic or universal cast. This aesthetic truth of art is very different from the philosophical and logical kinds. Poet Garcia Lorca describes meaningfulness by using the dr dramatic term duende. And if you don't 
know it, I would highly recommend his uh, essay on the uh, on Duende. Uh, sort of trickster spirit. He explains that the Duende is not a, a not the form of a work of art, but quote the marrow of form. End quote. It is the soul of the design. He says, quote, to seek out the duende, however, neither map nor discipline is required. Enough to know that he kindles the blood like an irritant, that he exhausts, that he repels all the, bl all the bland geometrical assurances, that he smashes the styles, end quote. Duende, quote, is a struggle, not a concept. Meaningfulness, not meaning, will continue to elude us as it should, but each different term for it the, uh, that artists have used may offer something new. For the book I, I was writing at the, uh, years ago, Fire in the Crucible, I had invented the word omnivalence, uh, which I can explain if somebody wants to hear it, uh, which David uh, liked and helped me develop. <clears throat> omnivalence is another attempt to describe this indescribable meaningfulness refers to a sense that an enduring artistic creation, there is always something more in the work that you just can't get when you try to assign or unearth its hidden meaning. It is the sense of richness and depth in the piece of something elusive to thought. In my inter interview with him for Crucible, David explained that he was trying to make his paintings, quote, so the viewer can constantly have the sense that this omnivalence is constantly going on. End quote. In other words, there is always something larger than the painting going on. And David hopes that you feel that larger thing, that larger thing's presence. For David, that larger thing um, may have to do with connecting, another favorite David word. But David is careful not to specify what the larger thing actually is. Of course, it can't be specified because it is, as Lorca says, a struggle and not a concept. The history of art shows that the artistic, that artistic meaningfulness, omnivalence, aesthetic truth, whatever you want to call it, can be evoked in any culture, any period, using any genre or style, and with any subject matter. Many of David's paintings might be categorized as landscapes. They have the feeling of sun and air, color of being in a landscape. What is the meaning of a landscape anyway? It is the coming together of ourselves and what we're looking at and immersed in. Great landscape paintings are moments of being. They are moments of experiencing the brooding omnivalence, the moreness of nature. So I want to stop at this point just for a minute or two and look at this painting, which is in the other room, uh, which David titled with a Wallace Stevens-like humor soluble meditation. <laughs> um, and then there, <clears throat> let me show you that there are a couple of close-ups of details. My wife is in there examining it for, for quite a while. Uh, the textures are wonderful. So that's back to the, the painting. So uh, let me put out a question, which we won't necessarily be successful in answering, but um, I think it's worth considering. Um, <clears throat> question, let me see how you know, I stated it. Uh, imagine you're the painter. How would you arrive at such a form? In a related question, uh, what do you imagine is going on in the mind of the painter? Is he thinking about dinner or is he... Uh... <laughs> Anyway, probably got some painters in here. <laughs> yeah. I want to say I just don't think you escape yourself, whether it's subconsciously or consciously. You know, I think um, I think you come through wherever you are at. David's question would probably be, "What what is that self that uh, you can't escape? You know, is it the idea of the self? Which which idea of yourself is it? If it's that." Is it? I don't think there's one cell within the cell. 
<laughs> so do you, do you think that's going on in the mind of the painter in some, in some way? I mean, it, this a, in a sense, a kind of practical question. You're there in front of an empty canvas. How, how does this proceed? I, I look at this whole process a little differently. In a sense, an artist is somebody, whether they are a painter or a writer or a musician, it doesn't matter. The impulse toward art, for me, is that this moreness that David talks about is prior to the creation. Because it's prior. It's prior where? It's prior in the place that all of this mourness, this connectedness, this total continuity and intimacy that the world is, is there already. And some people are very tantalized by it and attuned to it and can taste it mm -hmm. and have the urge to express it. So when they're facing a canvas, if they're a good artist, if they're an artist of worth, they don't say, I'm going to paint a landscape or paint a lamp or paint a circle. What they're constantly trying to do is to hone in on that more. How can I show the more, mm -hmm. which is essentially characterless, colorless, fluid, changeable, static, it's all the opposites. Mm -hmm. How can that be expressed in matter and in this particular medium? So all of that moreness or quality or continuity of reality is something that's <coughs> right beneath the surface for any artist who then wants to express it in some manner. So that's, that's what I think the job of the artist is, and that's what I feel that David was trying to do. Right, okay. He was uh, working on it. Uh, just to clarify, uh, probably some of you have seen the movie Turner. Mm -hmm. No? Um, kind of a good depiction, I think, of, of somebody who is uh, driven almost mad by uh, his attraction to the moreness of actual landscape, particularly landscape, you know, seascapes that have this kind of murkiness and, and um, uh, fogginess and impenetrability about, about them. So he's trying to express it not in the kind of abstract expressionist way that David is, but he's actually starting with he, he's he's being set off, let's say, by by the by that will and rhymes and rhythms of nature that will will set that, what set that off. You know, so for, for some for some people it may be uh, you know a, a particular kind of thing. You know, uh, Hopper arguably was set off by. Um, the yes. paint, as he said, he, he, all he ever wanted to do was to paint sunlight on the side of a building, right? But there, you know, there were other things too. There were windows. He liked windows. And, and so it's almost as if when he sees those things, he evokes it and he tries to figure out a way of painting it, right? So yeah, I think that, I think that you're getting at something there. Um, <clears throat> I remember uh, David had uh, many times mentioned to me uh, Giacometti, uh, a comment that he had made about uh, doing a sculpting a head. And he said he could only work uh, a short period of time because his pre preconceptions, the, the schemata that he had been taught and that were all, all taught of what a head looks like, uh, would interfere. And, and then he wouldn't, wouldn't be able to see that moreness, that omnivalence that, that uh, we're talking about. So you might be interested to, to hear David himself uh, take on this. Uh, he, he left, I found in my, in my notes, and it's undated, a, uh, an artist statement that he had done. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read that. It's not too long. I start my painting by placing marks at random to represent my current state of attuning to the universe. I move from those first groping respondings and resonatings to reactions, responses, and resonances to the first marks and their relationships to each other. 
the edges and the whole of the form that has arisen. So you can see there that those first barks then spark off the, big, the omnivalence and then he moves into it. New relationships in space appear and become opportunities for exploring new conditions for the laying out of forms. I'm also intrigued with the possibility of having work, the work stand in and of itself to exist without reference to any other form, that is, to not represent anything but itself. I like it best when the work has immediacy of presence that establishes its, its sense of concrete reality with clarity. When it has such concrete immediacy, a work seems to make a reality in a fundamental way that resonates with the process of making an object of perception. It thus connects me to my own acts of making that occur when, for example, I see a thing in the world and a painting is both something made and a metaphor for all making. Often when doing a painting, I note that there is a satisfaction with it. Uh, at the moment, it seems so perfect Then a few minutes later, this same form seems quite inadequate. And the whole that was beautiful, I can see people resonating with that, uh, and the whole that was beautiful collapses. I see how I built the image and how I wanted it to be whole as soon as possible. I see my process of making form and how I jump for closure and get attached to certain totalities. I am instantly thrown back on the uncertainty of the chaos that faces me on the canvas. When a painting has that concrete presence, it has its own structural integrity. It seems to arise according to its own principles of formation and seems to build itself out of its own primal elements. It arises out of the essence of being now and is like the creation of the world because it is the act of creating a world. In that sense, it is a metaphor for being born now in the present. And, as it, and it, as it is born, I often feel I too am being born in the act of painting because I am making myself as I honor and integrate my responses in the world into concrete realities that exist in the world. There's yourself, right? But that's, that's a, a, a different spin on self than than uh, most people have when you mention that. <clears throat> this description of David's creative process could also be a description of how a dynamical, chaotic system self-organizes itself as elements. In this case, colors, shapes, textures, pictorial gestures begin to feed back into each other and reinforce and resonate with each other, becoming indissolubly linked. David, staying aware to his own thoughts' deceptive inertia, the inclination to cleverly repeat itself and draw conclusions, follows the thread of being as he paints, his sense of omnivalence emerging fairly early after the first few marks on the canvas, uh, the painting beginning to coalesce into something like a metaphor for the mysterious primordial process one feels moving pervasively throughout nature, the process that made and continues to make the cosmos. So, uh, pause there to, to say we're sort of gliding over how difficult this is. Because with painting, of course, you uh, more or less, once you make that gesture on the canvas, you've got to move forward. You, you can't go back and say, oh, shit, that was a mistake. You know, you're stuck with it. Now you've got to go uh, rediscover that, you know, that. I had the omnivalence, I made that mark, ooh, it's gone. You know, and now it's just a thing, you know, it's just a mess. And now you have to re refine it. Sometimes that takes days, sometimes years. You know, poets who've talked about uh, poems that they've worked on for, you know, 30 years. Um, and they're missing two or three words. <clears throat> All right, so David's staying aware of his own deceptive inertia. Um, follows this being and uh, ends up with this something that feels to him like a metaphor for making. Uh, it wouldn't be quite right to say this, but we might consider David's picture, pictures as pictures that depict the push and pull of the creative process itself. 
or there might be paintings depicting the tangled up process of thought itself. Uh, or they might suggest where thought and the creative process are reversed mirrors of each other. But it wouldn't be right to say any of those things. Of course, as you look at David's paintings, you may observe that your own mind reflexively wants to know what it's looking at. What is this painting of? It's, I would compare it to being on, uh, on a dark night when your perceptual system and your brain detect a strange shape looming up ahead of you on the road and you become a little desperate to know what it is and your mind goes through. It's this, it's that, it's, you know. Um, <clears throat> so when confronted by uh, uh, a painting like uh, David's, I think it's a natural reaction to want to know, what am I looking at? It may take a while to, uh, to settle the brain into accepting that what you're seeing in David's paintings is the unknowable. Uh, it's palpable and sensual, but it's unknowable. It seems almost knowable, but in the end, the painting prevents you from saying what it is. David reluctantly accepted the label of abstract expressionist for his approach as a painter. Of course, you need label, a label to sell anything these days. Understandably, people want to know what kind of object it is that they're buying. Personally, I think it's more interesting to imagine that I'd be buying a little piece of the unknowable if I buy one of David's paintings. By attending to the moment by moment process of painting colors and shapes on a page, feeling the mounting tensions and connections between colors and forms, the individual David Schoenberg who lived and died and connected, he believed, with the universal process of making forms. Analogously, we may look at the painting in our own individual way. We may connect to that universal process too. I don't mean to say that we should impose anything like our individual interpretation on the painting. Absolutely not. Uh, that's a cop out. The way of looking that I'm talking about has nothing to do with interpretation, which is about meaning. This is about an openness of noticing and attention, letting your eyes move so that your viewer's mind, mind, in your viewer's mind, the painting can, as David wrote, build itself out of its own primal elements until something larger than the painting emerges. Think of the way fire moves through its fuel. Our vision begins to move through the painting. We begin to take in relationships, link linkages, echoes, juxtapositions, flows of energy. We begin to understand that what we're looking at is whole, as a fire-consuming substance is one thing composed of countless flowing interactions. Think about the death that, uh, that lives in the Native American prayer of universal spirituality, mitake oesen, or we are all related, everything is related. We are the earth, we are its trees, its sea coast, its spiders, its clouds. In this lies the indescribable meaningfulness of existence. So again, Wallace Stevens, the palm at the end of the mind beyond the last thought rises in the bronze distance. The gold feathered bird sings in the palm without human meaning, without human feeling, a foreign song. You know then that it is not the reason that makes us happy or unhappy. The bird sings, its feathers shine. The palm stands on the edge of space. The wind moves slowly in the branches. The birds fire feathered fangles. Feathers dangle down. So here's a way to think about David's work. <clears throat> years of reflection and study in many fields, years of sitting on the Truro Beach or sitting in his New York office listening to patients led David to the realization that reality is undeniably Heraclitean, fluid. Its relative stability in your thoughts and perceptions comes from the illusions of your abstracting process and the instruments we use to hold the ever-flowing liquid reality steady. Instruments such as words, visual auditory and tactile schemata, bureaucracies, skyscrapers. Let's imagine that, <clears throat> that what David does in his painting is to engage in a creative process that allows familiar reality to liquefy. He puts familiar reality in a blender. 
Thought bangs into itself and cracks open. The internal fluid leaks out. Thought yearns to recover its stability, but David won't let it. <clears throat> Forced out of its comfort zone, his thought as the known reveals itself as what it is, the unknown, surging with the underlying dynamic of the whole that takes place in everything. <clears throat> Think of his paintings as like surf, dedicated to Sam. If you look down into the zone where the waves wash the beach, you see currents crossing at many angles, foam, spume, bits of vegetation, fragments of shell and stone, the flotsam from ships and hurricanes, pellets of styrofoam, everything tumbling over itself, sloshing out and back, making and unmaking patterns and forms. One of his paintings is like, a, like that surf, calm in some places, roiled in others. The paintings on these walls are landscapes and mindscapes where the artist has abstracted or drawn out for our noticing the dynamism of the fluid and whole reality that exists like an unreality behind our thoughts and forms. So I have a couple of rocks. Actually, uh, it's dark, so I, I, won't, I won't pass them around, but they're up here. And I found them last week when I came for the opening. Uh, David's spirit in, in me directed me to pick these up. And they contain, I think, uh, sort of microcosms of David's paintings. Um, there are, of course, <clears throat> Creatures of an of a incredible history, of, where you've had uh, tectonic plates, plates uh, crashing together and uh, injections of magma flows and um, fragmentations and rolling over in countless millions of years of tides, uh, and all that's kind of pressed into these uh, these stones, uh, and they are a, kind of a testimony to the ceaseless dynamics that's going on in the in the universe. Uh, and they reminded me of uh, the kind of feeling of in enfolded uh, dynamics that uh, is in many of David's paintings. Uh, it's not surprising that David uh, saw deep connections between his paintings and the natural processes described by chaos theory and Bohmian quantum mechanics. Uh, both of these are theories that emphasize the inherent holism of nature and the actuality that everything is connected to everything else. Or as Christian Murray liked to put it in his brand of holism, where the observer is the observed. In such a way of looking, objects are provisional, if not non-existent, in some important sense. If we don't notice that very much, it's because we have overcommitted ourselves to the illusion of separating one thing from another, as if that separation shows us all there is. Separations are useful and necessary, it seems, but they lead us inexorably to sorrow and death. Recognizing the wholeness of things evokes our sensations of mystery and even joy. David's paintings are on these walls, but are they really separate from you? Is your consciousness really one encapsulated thing and the paintings another? As you immerse yourselves in them, can, can you feel the joy in David's creations? I think even the somber ones have a jouissance about them. They, to quote David again, glimpse something larger than the painting. They seem to me to be his, his joyful discoveries that we are all related. And as David would say, as far as our thoughts go, we are all, all deluded as well. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> So there, I don't know, is there time for questions or did, we, did I run through the hour? Yeah, a little bit of time. Yeah. Well, maybe we can get the lights. Ooh, thank you. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I would guess probably six or seven, maybe. Maybe a little longer, something like that. And then how long? Well, he died in 1993. Um, 
So he, some of the paintings I understand. I didn't. Uh, his wife Catherine, who went went through the paintings and with the uh, curator, uh, was trying to date them. Not all of them could be dated, but the uh, the paintings on on that wall in the other room uh, are part of what she calls the lung series, uh, which are clearly after the. Uh, his diagnosis and the paintings over here on this wall uh, of doors were also after the diagnosis. So, since you were friends with him, did you feel he was happier when he was painting? How was he different when he was painting as close as Oh, yeah, yeah I, I felt he was a lot happier. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a um, a difficult decision to leave his practice and not without controversy which he stirred, which he was likely, you know, he, he, was, he was fond of stirring controversies anyway. He stirred a few about Krishnamurti. Um, <clears throat> uh, but I, I mean, my observation was that he was re really uh, into it. And I think he described in that artist statement, he's sort of describing it, he's there. I mean, you, what's, what, what could be better than creating a world? You know, it's, uh, uh, but it, as I mentioned, it's uh, you know it's not all uh, w without suffering because you you when it, when you've gone into a painting and you suddenly lose it uh, and you have to work to get it back again or you have to abandon it that's that's uh, difficult. Uh, but the simple answer to your question, he yeah, was he was much happier doing the painting than. Uh, I think he would probably recommend, you know, creative activity for everybody. Yeah. Other questions? No. So, does that mean I answered all your questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you.